Welcome everyone to the end of line five, exploring legal pathways to permanently shut down the pipeline and stop the oil tunnel to protect the Great Lakes. I'm Liz Kirkwood, the executive director of Flow for Love of Water, a Great Lakes Water Law and Policy Center based in Traverse City, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. I am also very pleased to be co-hosting this webinar with our partners at Oil and Water Don't Mix campaign and in solidarity with our co-panelists from the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, National Wildlife Federation, and citizen-led Straits of Mac Alliance, whom I will introduce momentarily. First, a couple of housekeeping items. We are video recording this 90-minute session, and we will follow up with an email afterwards with a link to the recording and other related materials. Our plan for the webinar is to hold three mini panel discussions to provide legal and other insights into the past, present, and future of these 67-year-old pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac and Enbridge's proposed oil tunnel to replace them. We'll also highlight Enbridge's track record of damaging oil spills across Michigan and the Midwest. And we will end with our panel responding to questions submitted to you as attendees using the Q&A button found near the bottom center of your screen. And you can, use, you can use it to submit your question queries at any time during the webinar. We will also be taking your questions via Flo's Facebook Live feed. And finally, we're, we will be using the chat box to share links with key resources to you throughout the, the session. So with that, and before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to just set the stage and context for today's conversation. 10 years ago, almost to the day on July 25th, 2010, Enbridge's Line 6B oil spill, oil pipeline burst west of Michigan, Marshall, Michigan. And through a series of bungling missteps by employees in its control room about 1800 miles away in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Enbridge stopped and restarted Line 6B's pumps more than once over the next 17 hours, dumping more than 1 million gallons of heavy tar sands into the Kalamazoo River watershed. To date, it remains one of the largest inland oil spills in U.S. history in the wake of the BP oil spill. Eventually, Enbridge's oil spill polluted nearly 40 miles of the Kalamazoo River, destroying wildlife and habitat sickening hundreds of people and permanently driving 150 homeowners from their properties. Enbridge was fined 3.7 million for breaking more than 20 federal rules and the National Tra Transportation Safety Board reprimanded the company for a quote, complete breakdown of safety, unquote. Fast forward today, Enbridge's 67 year old pipeline, Line 5, a quarter century older then line 6B, snakes across the open waters of the Straits of Mackinac. And in this image, we're actually looking from the north side down to, to the lower peninsula. Um, and this pipeline pumps nearly 23 gallons of oil and natural gas liquids a day through the very heart of the Great Lakes. Past its life expectancy and propped up to extend its failing design, Enbridge Line 5 in the Straits of Mackinac is a clear and present danger. It poses an unacceptable risk to the public trust. And in the words of the Michigan Attorney General's Office, Line 5 is a, quote, environmental time bomb, unquote. What's unique about this pipeline is that it occupies public trust waters and bottomlands held in trust by the state of Michigan for the benefit of current and future generations. That means the state has a per perpetual sovereign duty to protect the paramount interests of these navigable waters and lands over private interests like Enbridge. The state may never abdicate this solemn stewardship duty and thus must ensure that it prevents harm, impairment, or pollution to its public trust resources like the Great Lakes. In the time that remains before Line 5 ruptures into our public waters, we, the people of Michigan and Governor Whitmer, still have a choice. Will we pursue all paths to trigger the end of Line 5, or will Enbridge's Line 5 trigger the end of Pure Michigan and a way of life as we know it in the Great Lakes State? Now, let me welcome our esteemed co-panelists today. I am delighted to be uh, joined by 
our terrific panelists. And if you could turn on your cameras so everybody can see you, thank you, welcome. Um, we first have Sean McBrearty, who is the Michigan Legislative and Policy Director for Clean Water Action, where he works on water infrastructure, oil and gas, and drinking water issues. He's been involved in the campaign to decommission Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline for the past five years and is currently the campaign coordinator for Oil and Water Don't Mix, the statewide coalition working to decommission Line 5. Next, we have Chairperson Erin Paymont, who serves as the tribal chairperson for the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, and he has done so for the past four terms. Uh, Dr. Paymont, also serves as president of the United Tribes of Michigan, as well as president of the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes. Among his many federal appointments, he was elected as the first vice president of the National Congress of American Indians and has served on numerous tribal health advisory boards. But he considers his most important qualification on this issue to be the fact that he is both the son of a tribal fisherman and was on the ground as executive director the tribe located near the spill of Line 6B. Next, I would like to introduce Patty Peak, who is a retired pediatric nurse practitioner and faculty emeritus at Michigan State University. For more than 25 years, she has worked in resource poor areas of the world, providing much needed healthcare services and securing access to clean drinking water. In 2006, she and her husband built a home on the streets of Mackinac. As it turned out, her North Shore home was the closest one to Enbridge's West Pipeline of Line 5. Her front row seat at, as the events unfolded following the April 2018 anchor strike and dielectric fluid spill reconfirmed her commitment and advocacy to shut down Line 5. She's the chair of the Straits of the Mackinac Alliance, an all-volunteer citizens group dedicated to preserving and protecting the waters of the Straits. And last but certainly not least is Beth Wallace, who is the Great Lakes Freshwater Campaign Manager for the National Wildlife Federation, where she works to protect the Great Lakes from toxins and organizes a, co a coalition of businesses that advocate for the Great Lakes protection. For the past 10 years, she's testified before Congress and the National Academy of Sciences on pipeline safety issues and co-authored the report that first exposed Line 5 sunken hazard, aging oil pipelines beneath the Straits of Mackinac, an ever-present threat to the Great Lakes. Beth is also on the, she's the board vice president for the Pipeline Safety Trust and has served on the board for over five years. So this is a terrific panel. I'm extremely excited to welcome you all and have a conversation with these experts. Now, before we take a deep dive on today's conversation, we were going to take a quick uh, and, and brief detour and interrupt with this breaking news as of 2.30 p.m., just two hours ago, and follow up immediately with media questions. So as, as I understand it, um, and I'm going to turn the mic over very quickly to Sean McBrarity, um, is that the Department of Natural Resources, which is the state agency that holds title to the Great Lakes bottom lands, has definitively, uh, as of today, rejected Enbridge's pledge and continues to demand that Enbridge Inc., which is the Canadian parent company to the grantee and its successors of the 1953 easement, enter into a written agree agreement to indemnify and hold harmless the state of Michigan for any spill and uh, related to line five in the Straits of Mackinac. Sean, would you be able to just elaborate and explain the significance of the state of Michigan's financial demands? Absolutely, thank you so much, Liz. Um, so last week, um, Governor Whitmer requested a couple minor things from Enbridge Inc., the parent company of the companies that own and operate the line five pipeline. Uh, her request included providing a minimum of $900 million in liability insurance with Michigan named as a co-insured um, to protect the states uh, or the state in the event of a line five oil spill. Um, unfortunately, and so the reason for this request is the state uh, commissioned a report 
that was released in October of last year that identified the fact that despite what Enbridge says to the contrary, um, currently uh, any payment from Enbridge resulted uh, from a line five oil spill would be entirely voluntary. The uh, subsidiary companies that are signatories to all of the state's agreements with Enbridge do not have the financial resources uh, to assure against a line five spill and an insurance policy does not exist. Um, therefore, any payments from the parent company would be entirely voluntary. Um, so uh, the state asked for this $900 million liability insurance, uh, as well as the resources of Enbridge Inc committed in a paper agreement with the state of Michigan in the, uh, in the event of a line five spill. And in response, um, Enbridge refused to guarantee their financial responsibility for a line five failure, um, you know, ironically coming the same week as the 10th anniversary of the line 6B Kalamazoo River spill, uh, which was caused by the same negligence that Enbridge continues to demonstrate to this day. Um, the failure here is jolting and it really begs the question of why is Enbridge refusing the state's request to protect taxpayers from line five spill damages. Um, and their troubling response here, uh, you know, could indicate that maybe Enbridge can't find an insurance carrier um, who would be willing to provide financial coverage for such a high risk, high consequence damage loss from the Great Lakes uh, oil spill from line five. Um, or perhaps it's that Enbridge doesn't believe the consequences for failing uh, to uh, pay for financial damages that the state's request aren't worth the effort or expense. And in either case, the state and Northern Michigan communities are the ones who will be devastated by Enbridge's failures here. Um, this is, uh, the, if there is a line five spill, this could be the Sanford Dam and the Edenville Dam on steroids, um, a bad corporate actor uh, relying on the state of Michigan to clean up after their mess, which we've been doing far too often as a state. So today we're asking everybody who's on this call, we have over 200 people on the Zoom and we have more watching on Facebook. We're asking you all to right now call Governor Whitmer's office, the constituent services line that's here on the screen. For those on the phone, 517-335-7858 and email uh, to the constituent services email, Gretchen.Whitmer at Michigan.gov, and request that in response uh, to Enbridge's negligence and failure to even indemnify the state from financial exposure due to a possible line five spill, that the governor does what should have been done a long time ago and revoke Enbridge's easement to operate in the Straits of Mackinac and shut down this dangerous pipeline before it shuts down tourism in our state. Um, and that would take questions right now from members of the press uh, who are on the call. And if there are members of the press on the call who have questions, please enter those into the Q&A box and also um, just indicate which media outlet uh, you are from. Thank you, Sean. I am awaiting to see if we have any questions that are coming in. Um, I'm sorry to do this to our, our listeners to just jump to the end of the story where we are right now, but I think it's illustrative of the fact that this is one of those stories that is, is very dynamic, it's very complicated, and within the last month, um, we've had significant damage on the pipeline that we will be talking about uh, that, um, you know, has has uh, led that led to the court order shutdown of of uh, line five, and um, we uh, well, we're I'm still waiting for some questions here. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any media questions at this very moment. Um, so I will. I'd like to, if it's okay. If, if anybody would like to say anything else, we can do that. Um, otherwise, I'd like to uh, really get into this rich discussion to understand where we are now as a result of, um, you know, a decade of, of work. Uh, and I'd like to first start off with um, Beth. Um, and 
you know, the, the first thing I just want to say to you, Beth, just personally, is that, um, you know, and I consider all of the panelists uh, friends uh, and allies. We've been working for many years together. But I, I'd like to just thank you, Beth, for your instrumental role in educating all of us about the existence of Line 5 with your seminal report, Sunken Hazard. And um, so thank you for that, first of all. And I'd like you to just take us back to the moment when you first learned, out, learned about the Line 6B Kalamazoo spill. What were your initial thoughts? And if you could talk about how it led you to um, research and identify other pipelines within Michigan uh, and what that journey has, has led to. Yeah, thank you, Liz. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you having me be a part of this discussion. And um, I, I really uh, am thankful for everyone's partnership, but particularly flows and the leadership you all have led on this um, important issue. And I, I look forward to continuing to work with you on this and others. Uh, well, I want to start by saying, uh, in order to really understand the 2010 spill, we need to go back about 10 days. When Enbridge, 10 days prior to the spill on July 25th, 2010, they testified before Congress saying that, uh, don't worry about their pipelines, they're okay. Um, we understand we have issues with them, but we can detect a leak mm -hmm. instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there will be no issues if there is a rupture. And they were being questioned by Congress because they had so many known anomalies on their pipelines that were going un un um, uncorrected and uh, they were being called in into question by the by FEMSA, the federal operator, because of uh, their lack of understanding of their system and the risk that it posed. So, you know, fast forward 10 days and uh, Enbridge in the control room was shutting down line 6B for maintenance and when they restarted the pipeline, alarms were going off all over the place. Um, Enbridge interpreted those alarms on line 6B to be something called column separation where they thought there was a bubble in the pipeline and their response to that bubble in the pipeline was to pump more product through and as Liz said, uh, they restarted the pipeline several times and they kept, kept trying to ram product through to impede that bubble that they were interpreting. Um, lo and behold, they ended up having a six foot rupture that was um, a result of many small cracks forming into one and eventually opening up into this gash that you see on the screen. Uh, during this time that they started to see alarm or hear alarm bells and, and see an issue um, of a loss of pressure, there were also 911 calls pouring in from Marshall, Michigan, uh, really hit with residents completely afraid that uh, there was a risk of explosion and that there was a massive oil, um, oil or gas leak somewhere. Um, within those 17 hours, first responders were in the area. Enbridge even went into the area and looked to see what was going on and they did not find it. It wasn't until Consumers Energy actually located oil on the ground and called Enbridge to tell them that this issue had occurred and that they had a leak. Um, Oh, next slide, good job. Uh, 40 miles of the Kalamazoo River were impacted. Ultimately, families were evacuated. The river became a no contact zone for upwards of two years, um, even longer in some locations that were completely um, saturated like Suresco Dam, which we're seeing right now on the screen, which was the first stopping point. The rupture actually occurred in a creek and went two miles down this creek until it hit the Kalamazoo River and then ultimately 40 miles of the Kalamazoo River were completely saturated with this oil. The river was at a flood stage, much like the Great Lakes are currently. And, uh, and so wetlands and uh, flood areas along the river were completely destroyed and decimated because of this spill. We also learned that this is the first time that this tar sands toxic oil had re been released into a water environment. And about several months into the response, EPA discovered that the oil was actually sinking into the water and moving with under um, the surface of the water into areas that they thought were not contaminated or had already been cleaned up. Enbridge completely downplayed this disaster for weeks and it, uh, it took several weeks before the state of Michigan issued a state of emergency which uh, allowed federal mm -hmm. resources to come in and help with the response. In addition to the oil, that there was also a toxic gas that was off-gassing as it started to weather called benzene and other carcinogens that were entering the air and so many of the community in the surrounding area 
uh, left the area and a lot of the homes along the river, um, like Liz said, about 150 homes were eventually displaced through a home buyout program, uh, but there was heavy evacuation, especially in the immediate location of Talmadge Creek. Uh, took again, like I said, two weeks to respond. Next slide, please. Um, it took two weeks to respond. Uh, the community members who were trying to rescue wildlife in those two weeks were threatened with lawsuits because Enbridge viewed uh, their response as a liability to, the, to their company. Enbridge was in charge of everything from response to wildlife, to cleanup of the oil, to reporting how much had spilled, to dealing with human health impacts. Uh, on a personal note, when I arrived on the scene that day, the day that it became public on the 26th, I saw um, wildlife trying to clean itself, a, a small muskrat. We called the uh, number on the signs to try to get a hold of anybody to try and rescue that, um, that particular animal. And all of those calls went unresponded. And this was the same number that the community was expected to call with health concerns, um, with concerns for their family members, uh, for bottled water concerns. I mean, everything was all going to this one number that was completely not responsive. Enbridge was also um, in charge of, like I said, all of the cleanup. And that was really a problem to be from the very beginning. Talmadge Creek, which we showed, oh, sorry, next slide, please. This is Talmadge Creek. It was completely saturated and uh, Enbridge ended up having to completely excavate this entire area um, and reconstruct the river from satellite images. And because they were in charge, um, first the federal agency, the EPA, was giving them orders on how to respond to this and Enbridge complied with those orders. But once the state became in charge, uh, it was clear that Enbridge had not done a thorough enough job and they ended up having to completely redo Talmadge Creek over again. And I believe parts of Talmadge Creek had to be redone in, as far as the cleanup because they did not dig deep enough and they did not get enough oil out um, upwards of three times. And so it just goes to show uh, how much of an impact this was and how concerning it can be when you have the at fault party also responsible for trying to rectify the situation and also being concerned about liability in the same, all in the same. Uh, they had very little concern for businesses along the uh, river system. And um, we have heard from Larry Bell on several occasions on his personal impacts as a business owner along the Kalamazoo River, as well as there are businesses um, all along from the beginning of Talmadge Creek through Battle Creek into Kalamazoo, um, upwards into Kalamazoo that had very direct impacts that went ignored for years and eventually Enbridge ended up settling uh, with several of those, but many of them ended up going out of business. Low income communities were completely shut out at the beginning from response. Eventually they were provided bottled water and air purifiers, but that did not come without uh, Enbridge trying to waive liability from uh, those homeowners and those uh, those residents and eventually that was uh, pushed out of the side but Enbridge did try to uh, offer bottled water to citizens that were impacted and in exchange for them not holding them liable which was called out during a congressional hearing. Uh, next slide please. Fast forwarding very quickly and I apologize that we're going so quickly um, but I wanted to give the, the moment in today uh, because we are facing the, the 10 year mark and there's still thousands of gallons that remain in the Kalamazoo River. Uh, they're located in wetlands and other sensitive locations where it's just too destructive to go in and collect that oil. And so now they are sitting and being monitored long term. Like Liz said, there's 150 families that have been formally relocated from the area because they no longer felt it was safe to be in their homes. There's never been a long-term health study done on the impacts from people being exposed to the, the toxic benzene for at least a year, but then you could even, uh, the EPA and other agencies were detecting it on sensors um, upwards of two years out. Um, and all of this is because Enbridge, the at fault company has never been uh, willing to, to support that long-term health study. Enbridge uh, ultimately spent $1.2 billion to clean up this spill that, like I said, that response is still ongoing today. And the EPA settlement that um, was mentioned earlier was, uh, it still has an active consent decree where Enbridge is required to do a lot of safety features along their entire pipeline network within the Great Lakes. Um, and that settlement 
uh, the consent decree that came from that uh, event has been violated twice so far. And we, uh, we currently just learned of another uh, violation of $2.7 million where Enbridge did not fulfill safety requirements, including on the Lakehead system, which Line 5 is a part of. And that brings us up to speed on the 2010 spill, which again, uh, the anniversary is this weekend. And that spill and that <clears throat> rupture led uh, the National Wildlife Federation to look into line five as a pipeline. We had heard in, in the heat of that response, just about a month into it, that Enbridge wanted to increase pressure onto line five. And so we wanted to understand more about that pipeline. We were startled to learn that that pipeline actually traverses the Straits of Mackinac for two miles. I'm sorry, for four miles uh, where it crosses in the sunken chasm right where the Straits of Mackinac are. So we, we uh, went into a fact-finding mission to try to get information about the integrity of the line, uh, when it was last inspected, how it traverses this location, um, and what type of product it moves in that line, and um, how old it was. Frankly, we didn't even have that information. And that's what led us to write the sunken hazard report, uh, which Liz referenced earlier. And that report really opened the, the eyes of the community on this risk that is posed to the Great Lakes. And uh, after the release of that report, and we hit uh, stonewall after stonewall of getting additional information um, on integrity, uh, integrity and um, inspections for Line 5, we decided to dive the line. And that is the, uh, the image that you're seeing here is when we first got eyes on uh, Line 5. And we learned at that point that the line actually traverses this location, follows the detours. It goes from about 60 feet below the surface of the water to sheer drop offs of around 300 feet below the surface of the water. And we've learned over the years now, uh, because there's been so many amazing groups working on this issue, that transparency is key with this company and that line five poses many risks beyond just being in this location, but also the operation of line five and how Enbridge acts as a company. Wow, that is uh, an incredible, incredible story, Beth. Thank you for for sharing that with us. Um, I I I remember when um, I mean, first of all, just to think about the the ecological destruction in the location of Kalamazoo, and I'm, I want to ask uh, Chairperson Paymont to describe his experience in a moment. Um, but I remember. Um, so I think about that, but then I think about these first images when we first saw the diver and, and saw the, the condition of this pipeline. We didn't understand that there were muscles coating this pipeline. We didn't understand that these, you know, this could have been a structural support or actually it was the wooden slats that were originally put around the pipeline in 1953. We, there was so much uh, discovery. It was this kind of you know, being a detective, um, really extraordinary story, Beth. Um, I, uh, chair, chairperson Paymont, I, I'd like to um, bring you into the conversation and invite you to share your perspectives, uh, also being a, a key person on the ground uh, and share your tribal perspective, please. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm in a, uh, as fate would have it, I think, I'm in a unique perspective uh, because I was the executive director for the tribe. Uh, I lived in Battle Creek. Uh, the headquarters are in Athens, and some of their tribal property extends over to Marshall, Michigan, and some of their sacred sites exist along the Kalamazoo River. And I, I can tell you that, um, you know, prior to the spill of 6B, um, I don't know that uh, Michigan citizens were all that aware that uh, this, these threats uh, existed right in our environment. And um, when the spill happened, it was complete and total chaos. Uh, it was during the middle of the day, I was at my office uh, at headquarters in Athens, Michigan, and a number of the team members uh, live in the area that was affected. And um, I can remember when it uh, first came, uh, became known uh, the, the very first sort of response we heard about was an evacuation. It was an evacuation of several streets of, uh, of citizens uh, because of the threat of the 
toxic uh, air as a result of uh, a benzene uh, in the in the air. And um, and so one thing that I'm very proud of the, the the tribe that I worked for was they established an emergency response. We ordered water and we brought food over to the headquarters and we invited not only the team members but anybody else affected uh, could come to the headquarters um, and get some relief uh, because they were displaced from their homes. Um, we didn't know the full extent. There was fear of ignition. Um, and then in the as this rolled out in the in the several days uh, that it rolled out. Um, uh, several federal agencies descended in Marshall, Michigan at a school uh, to have a basically Q&A and, and try to get a, uh, an emergency response sort of command center uh, to explain to people. Uh, the governor had, uh, this was Governor uh, Granholm, had come in and uh, had set up a helicopter tour to be able to see the damages and then uh, for citizens to be able to ask questions. And it was complete and total chaos. There was no preparation for this. Uh, the federal agencies were pointing fingers at each other of whose responsibility it was. Uh, the governor at the time took a, a real strong sort of responsibility in trying to address the issue. Uh, at the time, the uh, Battle Creek uh, Press had reported that the response was like Keystone Cops, running around all confused and not knowing. Uh, and you can add to that the anxiety of citizens not knowing uh, what what threat represented for ignition or for uh, their lungs. And, um, and and when we flash forward to line five, you know, we have all of those same concerns, only they're compounded uh, because we had a, uh, a spill that was relatively contained at the Kalamazoo River, just before the Kalamazoo River. But here we have a, a, a big pipeline that is submerged that is 10 years older that we have found, and I appreciate the presentation before uh, me, that we have found the material threats to the pipeline, um, the structure of the pipeline, the age of the pipeline, it would never be installed as it currently is today, uh, given environmental standards. And so, um, you know, I, so I'm responding to your question, and I think throughout there will be additional opportunities, but I can tell you that, um, Tribes universally are calling for the shutdown of oil pipelines that threaten our sacred sites, our treaty rights, and our natural environment. And earlier you introduced me uh, the different hats that I wear, United Tribes, MAST, and the National Congress of American Indians. And we have passed resolutions at all levels calling for the shutdown of pipelines that threaten our natural environment. And so I'll have more to say. I don't I want to monopolize, but I, I uh, want to talk about treaty rights and how can we be pure Michigan if we have a big oil slick running right through uh, the nexus of our, our tourism? Thank you, Chairperson Paymont. Very, very helpful to provide that perspective. I, and I was just thinking about, um, uh, and, and we'll get into this more because we have uh, Patty Peak, who's an adjacent landowner and many of, of you and, and so many of our other partners have uh, participated in um, in in um, uh, practice uh, oil responses at the Straits themselves. You know, in September, uh, and you know, you think about if if there is um, if there are waves over three feet, if the Straits are frozen, uh, there's essentially no response, um, and. Possible the U.S. Coast Guard, which is the primary uh, responder, says, you know, 30 to 40 percent of a cleanup of oil is considered uh, an A-plus performance. Um, so, you know, very, very uh, disconcerting. I, I want to talk to you more about um, the tribal interests, particularly about fisheries, but I I want to first um, introduce, uh, or um, excuse me, uh, let Sean talk about um, the, the public awareness of this issue uh, and um, oil and water don't mix um, over the years. So Sean, if you could speak to, to that, please. Absolutely. Thanks, Liz. And um, so uh, as uh, Beth identified, you know, Beth put out, and Beth and National Wildlife Federation put out the Sunken Hazards Report, um, which 
kind of hit like a bombshell throughout a lot of Michigan. People didn't even know that uh, this pipeline existed. Um, and the accompanying Vice News documentary with the footage of the pipeline um, was just shocking for people to see. And as part of that, a lot of organizations um, came together, including, um, you know, today the Oil and Water Don't Mix uh, team includes all 12 of the Native American tribes in Michigan, along with um, many uh, different environmental and uh, environmental and citizens nonprofits around the state, not, uh, not only environmental organizations, but groups like the League of Women Voters um, and the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority, um, which represents the five tribes of Northern Michigan. Um, and we came together to start the work to get this pipeline shut down. And the first big thing we had to do was spread public awareness and um, I can just say over the last seven years, um, we have grown uh, kind of astronomically and oil and water don't mix, um, you know, unlike uh, any, we're not a nonprofit, we're a campaign. And so our funding, uh, in fact, is pretty much 100% almost from uh, just regular people chipping in what they can because they value our Great Lakes and want to see this pipeline shut down. Um, our uh, volunteers and activists have been amazing. I mean, when, um, you know, one of the true signs of how much this uh, issue had touched people was, uh, I think, in the lame duck uh, period of the 2018 legislative session, when um, with about a month, we realized there was going to be a line five bill and we had to organize a very last minute <clears throat> lobby day to try to fight against this. Um, and so we called a lobby day with maybe about two weeks notice and we had over 200 people show up, uh, some from all the way up in the Upper Peninsula, from all the way across the state of Michigan. Um, and right now we have over 22,000 supporters, um, mostly in Michigan, but really from all across the country. When we had uh, retire line five parties, the farthest uh, satellite party we had, far, uh, the farthest away satellite party we had was actually on the big island of Hawaii. Um, we had people in Hawaii uh, protesting Line 5. So this has really turned into a mass movement that forced Line 5 to become a topic in the 2018 gubernatorial election where all candidates running for governor and attorney general had to publicly respond to us and uh, you know, let voters know where they are on this issue because at that point we had a poll, a poll that showed 87% of uh, likely Michigan voters wanted to see Line 5 shut down and were concerned about the risks inherent with a Line 5 oil spill. Um, so Oil and Water Don't Mix grew to fill uh, that need of providing a place to bring all these organizations and citizens um, and residents from across the state and really across the country together um, to fight uh, to shut down this pipeline. And when we knew uh, that the administration of Rick Snyder, which let's be frank, the administration of the Flint water crisis an administration uh, funded in large part by super PACs run by the oil and gas industry um, and Bill Schuette, our attorney general at the time who raised more money as the uh, chair of the Republican Attorney General's Association from oil and gas than any other time in history for the uh, Attorney General's Association. We knew these guys weren't going to take the action needed to shut down line five. Um, so oil and water don't mix was critical, I feel, in bringing this issue to the forefront um, and really making sure that people know that line five exists and uh, you know what we need to do to shut down that pipeline, which I'm sure we'll get into here in a little bit. Mm. So it's so ironic, Sean, you, you mentioned Attorney General uh, Bill Schuette, who initially said the, the days of Line 5 are numbered. And I remember as part of one of the campaigns, we started actually counting the days and we started getting into the thousands. I, I also just wanted to mention, um, if uh, Emma, if you go one slide back, please, um, on the lower right hand side, um, this picture depicts all the different counties uh, and townships and cities of communities across Michigan. And you notice there's a lot up in the Upper Peninsula. These are communities that demanded the shutdown of Line 5 before it became such a politically divisive issue in 2018. And I think it, it also echoes what Chairman uh, Paymont referenced in terms of resolutions 
um, at all of the sovereign uh, tribe levels of commitments to people to recognize that this pipeline represents this existential threat to our way of life. Um, I, I, I wanna bring Patty into the conversation and um, I wanna talk about the condition of this pipeline. So this pipeline is literally exposed on, in the open waters of, of the lake bed. And uh, it, it, you know, and, and the, the depth of the water is up to 250 feet and there's an actual ravine and a chasm. And the Bechtel engineers in 1953 had anticipated that the lake bed floor itself would provide the structural support needed so that there wouldn't be the bending and deforming of the pipeline. But what they underestimated is the power of the currents. Uh, so it's instead of two knots an hour, it's about four knots an hour. And as a result, essentially from the beginning of time, um, Enbridge uh, had just really struggled to figure out how, how to deal with this pipeline that was designed to undulate in the water, but with the lake bed erosion, there were sections of the pipeline that were greater than 75 feet. That magic number was referenced in the 1953 easement between the state of Michigan and Enbridge. And in 2001, it got so bad that, the, that Enbridge filed um, a uh, permit request to the DEQ at the time and said, this is an emergency. And then they proceeded, and they've been doing this for the past two decades, essentially, uh, creating these screw anchors to brace the pipeline down to the lake bed floor. A little bit complicated because it actually lifts the pipeline off the lake bed floor uh, and there are screw anchors. And Patty, I, I wanna just turn this conversation over to you to talk about um, the kind of threat that this elevated, uh, is essentially a suspended pipeline uh, poses to uh, an area that has some of the, the highest uh, navigational shipping um, in the Great Lakes themselves. Exactly. Thanks, Liz. And I, I too want to thank uh, Beth in particular because, uh, you know, when my husband and I built our home here in 2006, I had no idea, neither of us had any idea that there was this thing called Line 5 literally in my front yard. And um, until the sunken hazards paper came out and the publicity following it, I, you know, we did not, we were totally unaware that we had this, you know, this threat that could in any minute end our home. It's, you know, our retirement home we saved our life for. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start by saying since 1963, the, we've known that this pipeline has been in violation of the easement because that's the first time that there was acknowledgement that there was a gap of more than 75 feet. And uh, at that point in time, the solution for that was someone decided to put grout bags to hold up the pipeline. And this pipeline, you know, you have to visualize that it's not just an empty pipe, it is filled with a very hot liquid and it's very heavy and lying on the, the lake bed is precisely what that pipeline was designed to do. It was not designed to be up in the water column itself. Um, initially, when they first put in in 2001, 2002, the first of these screw anchors, um, I don't think anyone realized the fact that these are not going into, these are not going into bedrock. They are being screwed into what we call unconsolidated material. And that unconsolidated material is sand, it's gravel, it's clay, and it's cobble, none of which is a very stable kind of, of thing. So here you are screwing in these rods into an unstable floor, so to speak. And on top of that, you've got these currents that Liz has discussed. Um, which, by the way, we don't really know how, how fast they go and not in real time. And um, they go both ways. So one day it'll be going towards Lake Huron and the next day it comes back towards Lake Michigan and then it goes north and it goes south. So it's a very unstable, very interesting environment that we have in the Straits. 
So, you know, the problem is that now we have this elevated structure and since 2002, we have created more and more of these uh, pipeline supports, these structures, and we now have almost three miles of the pipeline is up off of the lake bed floor. So more than half of the, the pipeline is elevated. It is what we call a transition structure. It's a new structure. It is not one that was meant to be. And there has been no uh, application of what uh, we know as the Great Lakes Submerged Lands Act um, to any of the permitting for this, for this uh, pipeline and for these structures. So what happens is that Enbridge, since they were first put in, Enbridge has received permit after permit after permit uh, to do what they call maintenance on the pipeline, which in reality is changing the structure of the pipeline. It's not been evaluated. They've never been asked or compelled to do an environmental, uh, a full impi environmental impact study, nor have they been asked to uh, talk about whether or not these structures, these anchor supports really do what they're supposed to, or maybe they cause harm. And as we have seen, they also make it more of a risk for the anchors that go by um, to uh, lift that, that anchor support right off and uh, have, the, have a, a, a major disaster. You know, in, in April Fool's Day of 2018, there was an anchor strike that caused, uh, it severed the electrical cables that run adjacent to the west pipeline, right. uh, the, west, the west line of line five. Uh, it severed these cables and released 600 gallons of uh, dielectric fluid and also dented and damaged line five. Mm -hmm. And um, also, um, if, if we can go back, um, here's, here's the picture of the anchor strike. And as I understand also, Patty, the anchors themselves are actually contributing to the loss of the pipeline coating itself. Exactly. In fact, the latest, um, if you look at the, yes, right there, the, the latest pictures of the disastrous, whatever it was, uh, I, we believe anchor scrape from uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, not that one, but the, this one. If you look at the uh, left-hand corner picture of uh, the upper left, you'll see there's a saddle there. Um, on the far right, and you'll see a dark area on the bottom of the pipe. That is where the coating has been uh, at least uh, scraped away somewhat, and um, that coating is to protect the pipeline from damage. And what we know about just the anchor supports that have been um, along the, the rest of the pipeline, they abrade that coating. And so we know they do some damage. Um, right. And Enbridge says that it does nothing to it, but we know it does. Again, yeah. on the bottom right-hand picture, you can see that dark area on yeah. the pipeline. And that's where the, the uh, saddle itself that holds the pipeline in place has uh, moved and shifted with the anchor drag uh, or whatever force it was that caused this latest uh, failure of the anchor support. So, well, this sure doesn't look like repair and maintenance to me. This looks like a pipeline that is long overdue. I want to just turn our conversation, thank you, Patty, yeah. to talk about um, over the years, what kind of um, alternatives have been explored? Um, and Beth, um, I'm hoping that you can uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that, um, and I think this is very significant, uh, following the Line 6B disaster, Enbridge was able to double its capacity in Line 6B without the kind of rigorous public scrutiny uh, and questioning about the public need and whether or not uh, that could have been done in exchange for the decommissioning of Line 5. Um, yeah, the other issue, uh, I know National Wildlife Federation and many organizations have been focusing on a lot is about uh, meeting the propane needs in the Upper Peninsula. So I was hoping you could talk about that, Beth. 
Yeah, um, very briefly. So when the spill happened, PHMSA, the federal agency, um, had Enbridge on an emergency order. And that emergency order gave Enbridge a window to really streamline a replacement for line 6B, which is now the new line 78. And what happened is instead of taking out the line 6B that ruptured, they built a brand new pipeline right next to it that uh, switched from a 30 inch line to a 36 inch line. Uh, so it doubled the capacity of what was actually transported through line 6B. Um, and they evaded a lot of scrutiny because they um, did this under the emergency order, and then uh, they replaced the St. Clair River crossing, which is the international border crossing under maintenance, like you said, and, uh, and then they uh, segmented the replacement for the inland section, and it all fell to state oversight, um, which is a cautionary tale for Line 5, I will say. Um, when it comes to Line 5 and alternatives, we have, uh, we, we were fortunate enough to um, commission a independent uh, ec economist to look at what the needs were for Michigan, uh, what the needs are for Michigan from line five, and how can we meet those needs through alternatives. Um, and this econ economist actually used a lot of the findings in the dynamic risk and the, um, the reports commissioned by uh, the state under the Snyder administration as um, the baseline for their report. And they looked strictly at what Michigan utilizes and how can we offset those needs through other sources. It didn't take a lot for them to realize that um, there were already alternative sources in place in the UP that we can pull from. And uh, we can easily get propane to UP residents and to Rapid River, particularly to the depropanizer where line five um, shoots off less than a percentage of product on line five goes off into Rapid River. Um, that can be offset by a handful of trucks a day and a, or a handful of rail cars a day. Um, and this is true also for the lower peninsula and any needs that uh, are there. Uh, now she has concluded in that report done by London Economics International that um, any impacts would be within the price fluctuations that we already experienced with um, propane and oil and gas and uh, consumers, it would not be noticeable to consumers <clears throat> at all. Now, since then, there's also been the UP Energy Task Force report that has come out that has further justified a lot of the findings in the um, LEI, London Economic International Report, um, and also identified other sources where propane could come from in the UP. They also noted that if you increase storage and you also put into, um, into place incentives for homeowners to uh, fill up their tanks in the off season or to um, switch to electric sources, then the, the impacts would be completely offset. And in fact, the UP would be um, better off because we're building in redundancy to the system and potentially lowering costs uh, more long-term, which is desperately needed for much of the state of Michigan when it comes to energy. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's, you know, if you plan for the decommissioning, it, it, it is possible. Um, instead, we've really drawn out this process, you know, and the playbook in the Snyder administration was to have a, a task force and an advisory board and then culminating in this sweetheart deal of 2018 with agreements and then Act 359. Um, Boy, we are racing out of time here. I do want to ask uh, Chairperson Paymont to talk about um, the role of Standing Rock in 2016, what that meant in terms of uh, shining a spotlight on um, treaty rights, on pipelines, and also what it meant specifically for the tribes in Michigan with regard to the Line 5 fight. Absolutely, and I think we're trying to queue up the uh, photo. I do have a, a, a picture of uh, a group of us at um, a, a national rally in um, Washington, D.C. with Standing Rock. So um, Standing Rock became, it was really a movement. It was an opportunity to shine a light on some of the challenges in Indian country. And you can't overstate the, the impact of, of Standing Rock and Water is Life um, uh, campaign. And um, what that issue was about was very similar to our issue. It's the, an oil pipeline that's threatening 
the natural resources, uh, the sacred sites, and the treaty rights uh, that tri indigenous tribes have endured through legal uh, contractual arrangements, uh, both in the Constitution and in legal documents. Um, and so um, it, 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 it brought to light and it ignited an interest uh, that uh, we hadn't seen at, at this level before. And so it reminded us, though, that these issues are not only in um, other states, but right here in our own territory. Um, I became good friends with the chairman of the Standing Rock Tribe, Dave Archambault. Uh, he's pledged his support and ongoing support uh, to help us. And what's really critically at stake is, um, so my people, the indigenous people of this territory, have lived here since time immemorial. Uh, we have fished these waters since before another famous fisherman fished the waters uh, in another part of the world, and that's Jesus Christ. And I'm a Star Trek fan, so I believe in the prime directive, which is you don't do any harm to the natural environment or the people. Um, but this pipeline threatens um, our continued practice of a centuries-old um, uh, tradition of, of fishing. Uh, whitefish are embedded in our oral tradition. They're called Atikameg. And uh, they were given to us by the Creator to help us to survive lean times. And what we see with uh, climate change and invasive species, unfortunately, is a very delicate balance of the fish ecology. And what we're very concerned about is we know that even a minor spill, if they were some magically able to contain a spill, um, a minor spill will decimate and eradicate our whitefish herds. Uh, in our Great Lakes and eliminate a centuries-old uh, practice and, and way of life. Um, you know, this story is one of negligence and manipulation. Um, early on, when I was invited to help out with uh, the first press conference I think we had, and I don't know how that ever came about, but I'm grateful for it because, as it turns out, fate kind of put me in a position to understand this issue, having been at, um, at the Line 6 spell and then knowing what the threat represents here. But if you recall, when we had our first press conference, we had asked questions about that, uh, about the easements and the legal documents, and the state had no idea where they were. And the fact that they had no idea where they were means that they had no idea what the terms and conditions were with the anchors. And that is pure negligence. And one of the things that I want to bring to, um, to light is that we have an enduring treaty right that was memorialized in a legal uh, challenge and a consent decree, and Michigan has a, uh, a, a responsibility to co-manage the resource. They also have a liability on the other end. Supreme Court precedence in the last five or six years has demonstrated that there is a liability for states that don't protect the natural resources that could violate the treaty rights of the indigenous people. And so I have shared with the previous governor and with, it, and with our current governor that there is a liability on the other end of this. Um, if our natural environment is decimated and our treaty rights are destroyed and we can't practice the right, we will be looking for somebody to hold accountable. And so I'm hoping that this latest with the governor asking for the full insurance coverage to be included and the liability coverage, that's something I asked six years ago of the previous governor and pushed through the pipeline safety uh, testimony and consultation. I think it's, an, it's a move in the right direction, but the next step is to demand it. If we don't receive it, we need to shut down line five immediately. And then the next step is to promulgate new regulations so that we're not continuing to operate in an environment where big oil is calling the shots. When the anchor strike hit the line and we asked the governor's office, uh, the previous governor's office in our monthly tribal call, how big is the damage, you know, and how, how bad is it? And, and the you're talking about back, in June. You're, are you talking about in, in the most recent one in June? Yes. Yes. No, no, uh, no. Going back uh, a couple years ago when the okay. anchor strike happened and the response back was, well, we'll have to call Enbridge and find out. And that's not acceptable. This is our the, the state has a public trust uh, and the public trust doctrine and a responsibility. It's not acceptable to continue to be deferential to an oil company that their motto is pipe and pray. They don't say that, but that's that's precisely what it is. <laughs> and this whole concept of this tunnel it's a red herring. It's, it's fake. There, uh, we know from the topological studies that the crevasse is so deep that it's not possible for a tunnel to be built across that crevasse. And I, I think that what they're doing is they're biding time for as long as they can, as long as there's no insurance to hold them accountable. 
the, the expense of the spill will be just the cost of doing business. They wrote off all of this at line six as the cost of doing business. They're going to continue to pipe oil for as long as they can. They know that a spill is going to happen, and then they will, will have to litigate to get uh, recovery on that. And that's all in their calculation. And so it's, it's time that the governor and the attorney general, we have an opportunity now like we've never had. We need to demand that we shut down line five. And um, there's no excuses at this point. Ignorance is bliss. Before we didn't know better, now we know better, and we have a duty and responsibility to shut down line five. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to, um, the, the time is just racing along, how it, how it happens. It's amazing. Um, I, I just uh, love the way that everybody is um, sharing the incredible knowledge you all have. Um, I'd like to shift us to the, the current uh, developments. I mean, we now, um, Emma, if we can, we're going to move. Um, we, I mean, there's so much to talk about the economic uh, damage. I mean, real questions of whether 1.8 billion even really is, um, you know, satisfactory. And then, you know, the question, the issues that, you know, uh, Beth has raised, you know, how, how can you even clean an ecosystem as dynamic as the, the Great Lakes. Um, extraordinary uh, questions that we don't even want to ponder uh, because we want to prevent this accident from, from happening. Um, but on, on this slide here, we can see that there are multiple pending uh, legal cases. We've shifted um, you know, from the Snyder administration um, to the Whitmer administration where all of a sudden there is rule of law that is governing the decision-making processes. Uh, and I just want to bring your attention to the Enbridge v. State of Michigan case, which is um, the, uh, Enbridge is trying to uphold the, the uh, Act 359, which the Attorney General um, uh, authored an opinion and found to be unconstitutional because of the title object issues. It says the Mackinac Bridge Authority, but it's actually about a tunnel, um, you know, complicate, more complicated than that, but that's in a nutshell. And then the other, and that's pending before the Supreme Court. But then the other case um, where we're really focusing attention on is the people of Michigan versus Enbridge. This is the case that Attorney General brought before uh, Ingham County. And the basis of this claim is to void the 1953 easement because of the failure of the state to um, uphold its public trust analysis. Uh, we've got public nuisance, um, the Michigan Environmental Protection Act, and remember the ongoing violations of, of Enbridge to, uh, to act with due care as a reasonably prudent person, um, and, and all, you know, what Patty talked about with the the, uh, seven, the maximum spans. Um, so I want to bring us to this moment, this incredible moment that happened last uh, month where um, we had a court order shutdown of uh, the oil in line five, the first time ever in its 67 year history. And I'd like to um, have each of you, uh, and I'll start with Patty, um, uh, to talk about your impressions and observations of this moment. What is it going to take to shut down? Um, you know, and please, you know, you can talk about the um, today's news. Uh, anything you want to share um, with, with the audience because uh, we were in a very different moment. Well, just, just like the oil or the anchor hit in 2018, at that point in time, I, I thought game over, you know, we had all the press coverage, everybody said, oh my gosh, we can really have an anchor hit because obviously Enbridge always said they weren't gonna have it happen. It was, it was such a simple thing that they weren't ever gonna be able to uh, have to worry about that. Well, we now know that it's happened a couple of times and um, maybe more. And I, I guess at this point in time, to have a judge have a temporary restraining order and close it gives me a lot of hope that perhaps there will be enough of a public outcry and enough people that really realize that this is in fact an absolute risk 
to our way of life, to our economy. I, I think the timing also in, in relation to coronavirus, because we're so aware of the issues related to our economic uh, welfare in the North in particular, because tourism is such an important part of our economy, um, that to, to have the idea that there could be a spill that will absolutely decimate everything that we have and and literally our way of life will be gone yeah uh, drinking water every i mean everything exactly exactly right, right. So I mean, it really is it really is beyond the pale that it that this pipeline could remain open um sean i i, I i'm interested to hear your your perspective um about um this situation and um i may i, I might throw something else in while you're talking as i'm thinking there's so much to talk about <laughs> there there is there's a lot to talk about on this issue and um <clears throat> so back in october of 2018 um right when governor snyder announced the deal that the state had crafted with enbridge to build an oil tunnel through the straits of mackinaw um we uh so clean water action and sierra club held a press conference with our attorney general candidate at the time, Dana Nessel, um, where she stood up and was very forthright and upfront about the fact that under her watch, uh, line five was going to be shut down. She was going to do everything she could to make sure that we're shutting down that pipeline and not doing anything as foolish in the era of a climate crisis as building an oil tunnel underneath 20% um, you know, of the world's fresh drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, so she has followed through 100%. Um, now, Enbridge v. State of Michigan um, deals around Act 359, which was the lame duck tunnel law, which is likely unconstitutional, but I mean, that's going to have to be up to the state Supreme Court. We'll see what they say. Um, our real sh best shot of shutting down Line 5, uh, the way things stand right now, is a combination of two things, in my opinion. Number one is People of Michigan v. Enbridge, um, which is, uh, you know, the case we've been asking for really for the last seven years, um, which claims that based on the state's obligation to protect the public trust waters and bottomlands of the Great Lakes, among other things, um, we cannot allow this pipeline to operate and that the fact that the state failed to consider its public trust duties and obligations back in 1953 when they granted the easement means the means the easement is void on its face um, and never should have been never should have existed to begin with right. um, so the attorney general has done everything in her power and continues to do everything in her power to shut down this pipeline the next step that we need right now um, that would be the final nail in the coffin for enbridge is Governor Whitmer doing two things. Number one, ordering the Department of Natural Resources to revoke Enbridge's easement to operate. DNR is undergoing a review of Enbridge's easement violations dating back to 1953. And Enbridge is using a common tactic um, for large corporations with very shady ethics records of um, using a very, very common tactic here of burying the state in paper. Mm -hmm. And our underfunded state government um, is simply not able to process all of the paperwork uh, that they're getting from Enbridge from their requests quickly enough. Um, we, you know, just, the state is uh, severely underfunded as far in a lot of different areas. In the last 20 years, our state general fund has remained the same. Um, so uh, what we need is for this DNR easement review, which is supposedly almost completed, um, is going to reveal many different easement violations, but we already have on the record several of them. And in fact, uh, Judge Jamo, in his ruling on the temporary restraining order that the Attorney General requested, mm -hmm. admitted that Enbridge is in violation of the due care clause of their easement. So this should be a slam dunk mm -hmm. for Governor Whitmer and her legal team to immediately join the people of Michigan v. Enbridge. And at the same time, um, she should direct uh, Director Eichinger of the Department of Natural Resources to revoke Enbridge's easement um, and shut down the pipeline immediately. So yeah. Yeah. really Thanks. a two-pronged strategy, and that's mm -hmm. where we need to go next. Okay, fantastic. Um, can we go to the next slide? I, Beth, I want to bring you into this conversation, too, because 
So it's, it's you know sometimes it's kind of confusing to the public. We we have we have two things happening. We've got the line five that's continuing to operate every single day. Twenty three million gallons of oil is being pumped through the heart of the Great Lakes, threatening you know a catastrophic disaster. What and then we also have a proposed tunnel that Enbridge has posited as a solution. They've they've crafted legislation under the Snyder administration. Um, let's and we've talked about all these litigation, but we also have some administrative proceedings. Um, a joint uh, tunnel permit with Eagle and also the Army Corps of Engineers. You can see lots and lots of different um, uh, Clean Water Act. Uh, permits. And then if we go to the next slide, please. And then the state is also involved because with what because there's dual jurisdiction for these hazardous liquid pipelines. Um, and the Michigan Public Service Commission plays this critical role in the siting. Um, Beth, I'd like you to talk about um, this process and, and kind of the decoupling of Enbridge's proposed tunnel solution. Um, it versus, uh, you know, what what the public now will be discussing, which is whether or not there's a public need for this pipeline, the whole 645 miles of it. Can you give us a perspective? Yeah, just like everyone has said, uh, we have a, a really dire emergency right now where we have a pipeline that's sustaining you know, undetected damage from unknown sources. To, we don't know how often that's happening. And, and we don't know when the next potential catastrophe could occur. And so this is an urgent moment that the governor absolutely has to act on. And I agree with Sean 100%. She needs to join that case, uh, People of Michigan versus Enbridge, and she needs to start the easement revoking process. Those two things happen, have, have to happen immediately. But that's completely separate from this tunnel alternative conversation. And Enbridge has done, uh, has actually spent millions of dollars in Michigan really trying to convince the public that one cannot happen without the other, but they absolutely have to be separate. And when you look at the permitting process that Enbridge has just started, you'll really understand why we cannot wait for this alternative that has been floated. Um, in, in particular, I'll pick on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because many of us just concluded some comments uh, regarding that permit. and their application is so incomplete and so inconsistent. Uh, they haven't even concluded the design phase for this tunnel and they're moving forward, forward with permits. The, the, water, uh, the with water withdrawal and discharge is changing on a daily basis and we've already put in comments. Um, many of us have requested that the US Army Corps of Engineers has to, to really halt this permitting process, go back to the drawing board, do an environmental impact statement as well, our environmental impact uh, study, as well as do a public hearing, because in the current form, it's just completely unacceptable. Another thing that's currently happening is that um, the Eagle has said openly that they're hoping that the Michigan Public Service Commission will do some of these impact studies and an, an analysis, but the timing just doesn't make any sense. For example, the, the Eagle permits can be issued, and Eagle is really looking at the tunnel itself and the construction of the tunnel. Whereas the Michigan Public Service Commission, uh, Enbridge is arguing that they're only really looking at the pipeline. Many of us argue they need to look at the whole thing. It needs to be holistic and system thinking. But if Enbridge had their way, they're only looking at the pipeline. So if Eagle approves the permit in the Michigan Public Service Commission process, which is anticipated to be about a year long process is moving slow, then Enbridge could technically start construction on a tunnel before they have approval for the pipeline, which is just absurd. And so there's there's a lot of miscommunications and problems happening, which will all lead down to a path of lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. And when we first heard of this tunnel project, Enbridge was even saying, you know, this will be a decade. It's it will take a really long time, and they're actually downplaying it. And now we're hearing them say, oh, it'll be four years. There's no possible way this will be four right. years. It'll be a, closer to a decade. Okay. Right, and the cost of half a billion, I mean, it could be, you know, orders of magnitude, a billion plus. Yes. Um, it's, it, um, the, the other thing I think about with, specifically with the, Mich the Michigan Public Service Commission um, analysis, asking the question, is there this public need? 
this is the first opportunity where we as the public is getting involved in this conversation talk about feasible and prudent alternatives we're talking about climate change we get to talk about you know do is it it, do we really need to have an oil pipeline infrastructure here for the next 100 years? Exactly. Um, that is not a reality that um, really, um, well, it's just, it doesn't comport with reality is what I want to say. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, there, there's a real mismatch there. And uh, it's imperative that Michigan as a state um, is is ensuring that any kind of investment in infrastructure whether it's about water or energy um, that it it is consistent with the future um, i cannot tell you how many um, fantastic questions i have from um, the public here uh, and so i want to um, uh, start turning my attention and reading these questions so i'm going to be looking over my other screen here um, uh, I want to um, ask about, um, let's see, um, we, all right, we have this question about, um, the, about the insurance and um, it, the, the insurance of course has been listed at 1 point billion estimate for direct losses of a major spill in the Straits. The estimate of maximum damages has been criticized as severely underestimated total losses. How can we force Enbridge to assume all of the risks for its operations? I guess the question is, do you think that's possible? Do you think the state will ask for it? Um, and, and how also will this, you know, feed into uh, revoking the current operations to stop uh, the flow of oil? So anybody wants to take that? <laughs> okay, so, there we go. Chair so I think a term and condition of continuing the easement absolutely has to be that uh, this company has to bear the, the expense of the price of doing business. And that includes covering the full insurance costs. Again, that's something I asked for uh, six years ago. Um, and, but that's, we know that's minimally the cost. That's probably the direct cost, the estimated direct cost but the indirect and induced economic impact is multiples of that because we, we anticipate that an oil spill, you know, I brought my Pure Michigan mug. I'm probably a Pure Michigan supporter, but we cannot be a Pure Michigan if we have a big oil slick. All of those in that industry, our tourism industry, uh, which is I think I've seen about a third of our total economy in the state of Michigan will be interrupted. All those people who are working in those industries their employment will be interrupted. And we're going through that right now so we can see some of the expense of unemployment. But um, we are all gonna bear the cost of the unemployment that we're gonna have to cover. Every taxpayer in the state of Michigan is gonna bear that cost. The other thing is this, this red herring of this idea that, that they're really gonna build the tunnel. They are not gonna build the tunnel. They know it's not possible. But it's to buy more time for them to continue to pump oil and to collect revenues um, but all the, the projected expense, remember now, they've revealed, they played their card. When they were looking to be under the Mackinac Bridge Authority, they wanted the state of Michigan to pick up the cost of this construction. And so now they're, they're suggesting they're going to cover the cost. But what's going to happen is over a time period, we're getting out of the fossil fuel, whether we like it or not. We're coming to the end of that horizon, that event horizon. And when we get out of that, then uh, this company is going to abandon the development and somebody is going to be on the hook for the expense. And you can bet that's going to be the Michigan taxpayer. So yep. whether people realize it or not, they have, they have skin in the game here because it's going to be themselves, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren that are going to pay for the cost of the damages or for the tunnel. Yeah. I, and I just want to um, thank you for that. I, the, it's amazing to think in April, we had the, the cost of a barrel of oil was negative $30. I don't think anybody could ever have imagined that. So, uh, you know, with less oil demand and these unbelievably declining uh, oil prices, um, coupled with cancellations of major projects like the Atlantic Coastline Pipeline, with, um, with environmental impact statements that are being ordered uh, for the Dakota Access, even after it was built, there, uh, there are headwinds 
that are really changing uh, the dynamics of whether or not this industry is um, is is going to be viable um, at the kind of level that um, it was, you know, less than a decade ago. Um, we have questions about um, whether or not Enbridge even has a detailed cleanup plan if Line Five leaks under the straits. And as far as you know, as Beth indicated, um, I, I think there the the um, permitting. Uh, uh, application as I've, I've as I've reviewed it, it really has no indication if there are um, any kind of containment uh, ponds that or um, structures at either end in the north and the south. Um, so I think the answer to that is no. Um, and as Beth said, there's there's a, a lack of information. Go ahead. Yeah, the other thing that is being explored and considered during this review process for the permits is. Uh, the risk of the NGLs in the line, uh, which is that when released into the environment, NGLs are heavier than air, and so they sit, and it's a huge explosion risk. And so having an NGL, a pipeline that transports both oil and NGL at the same time in a tunnel underneath the Great Lakes with the explosion risk is, is quite tremendous to wrap your head around. And is, um, when the pipeline is running oil, it's an interesting uh, thing to bring in that kind of I think is illustrative of Enbridge and um, what their lobbyists um, actually go around telling people. Some of Enbridge's lobbyists were trying to sell Michigan lawmakers uh, earlier this year <clears throat> on the fact that, oh, if there's an oil spill in the tunnel and the tunnel breaks, no worries. The oil will just go back underground where it came from. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's 100% not true. And uh, any basic understanding of physics um, would let you know that. But that is what their lobbyists are selling to Michigan lawmakers. And when we talk about, um, I think, I th uh, thank Chairman uh, Paymont for bringing up uh, the fact that we need to change policies so that big oil is not controlling things. Uh, the Line 5 fight has been a huge picture of the gross damage of money in politics. Um, because this really is a money case. This is the reason why Snyder didn't do anything was Enbridge and the oil industry's support. Um, and there are those who support the oil industry on the left um, who are also major political donors. And we need to get corporate money out of politics if we're ever going to get big oil out of the driver's seat. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just clarify one thing for the audience is that um, uh, Line 5 currently does not uh, carry any heavy tar sands in it. It does carry refined tar sands from Superior, Wisconsin. And, uh, and, and so, um, and, and there is a, a ban uh, that has been signed um, with the state of Michigan, although that, that agreement, um, you know, is, is, uh, could, could be changed and altered. Um, and if I if I could, yes. yeah, please. Um, Enbridge is currently arguing that the state really doesn't have oversight over their operations. Uh, they are leaning on FIMSA, and Enbridge has um, absolute. They really don't have to indicate when they change product types with FIMSA. It's a box they check check annually on a report, mm -hmm. and crude is crude to FIMSA. And so, at any point, if if Enbridge is truly holding their ground that FIMSA is the only oversight for operation, then they can change product at any point. Thank you. That, that's great. Um, so in terms of we are really we're coming to a rapid close here. So in terms of, you know, legal pathways forward, I, I um, you know, Sean, you, you, I think you've uh, really articulated very well is two things need to happen. And, and I think we're going to move to the next slide. Um, uh, one is to uh, and, and here, here's the moment where we're asking audience members, um, and a, you know, we'll have panelists chime in here too, is to take action. So we're asking um, folks to uh, request and urge the governor to revoke the easement, uh, and that's number one, and also to join the attorney general's lawsuit. Um, and so there are, um, you know, we would actually hope that you can take multiple actions here. You can sign flows um, request, oil and water don't mix request. Um, and then if we could go to the next, um, the Straits of Mackinac Alliance also has um, 
an, act, um, an action um, uh, alert right there. And also um, as a citizen led group um, supporting the Mackinac Alliance. Uh, they've been invo involved in contested cases involving the anchor uh, screws and the um, and, 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 and really lifting up the fact that this is not repair and maintenance, this is a new structure. They've, uh, they have been joined by the Grand Traverse Band and the, city, the city of Mackinac Island. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, other things that uh, folks can do is stay involved. This is just an ever-changing and dynamic landscape of an issue, if there ever was one to get involved in the MPSC tunnel hearing, um, which will take place on August 24th. Um, uh, let's see, and um, additional comments. We, we submitted comments, gosh, was it was just last week on, on July 14th uh, to the Army Corps. Um, and in this, um, uh, issue about impacts that Beth referred to is, is really remains very vague and a full EIS under NEPA has, has to happen. Okay, next please. Um, okay, well we do have, we have a couple of more minutes and before I turn to that. Um, I, I, I just ask um, our panelists if you have, you know, final kind of takeaway messages that you would like to leave, leave with our audience uh, members uh, and knowing that, that uh, folks can still get hold of you after the webinar. I'll jump in real quick. Um, first of all, I'm extremely proud of our Attorney General. She campaigned on this. She is following and she's good to her word. I served on her, served on her transition team. And so I'm, I'm just so grateful that she's following through with what she said. Um, the governor, I was the first person in the state of Michigan to sign her nominating petition. She also campaigned on shutting down Line 5. I know that she's got a, a delicate balancing act with her constituencies. Um, I'm hoping labor doesn't have too much of an influence on the outcome. And when we understand that a tunnel is not feasible, that labor issue goes away. And so I'm hoping she's got a great deal of weight on her shoulders right now. Um, and with this issue, especially for her to be able to make the right decisions and join the lawsuit and protect the natural resources as a public trust. She does not want it on her reputation to be the governor when an imminent spill happens. Thank you. So true. Patty? Well, you know, in 1953, when Michigan granted this easement to carry oil, our world was very different than it is now. You know, at that point in time, there was little or no con uh, consideration of the environmental effects of anything, basically, in industry. You know, the eagles were dying from DDT. There were toxins everywhere that caused cancer. You know, the waters were so polluted in the uh, river, the Cuyahoga River, that it started on fire. You know, that's the river that leads into Lake Erie. Gratefully, we've learned a lot since then. We have uh, learned that our resources really are limited and they're, and they're precious and we simply must do everything that we can to shut down this pipeline that threatens our very livelihoods and our, uh, and our greatest resources and our, our greatest gift and that's that water. It's the most precious thing there is. Water is life. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Sean? Well, thank you uh, very much for hosting tonight, Liz. And thank you everybody for participating. Uh, water is life, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, Patty talked about looking from the past and how the past was different. I wonder what people will think 50 years from now um, with climate change advancing as fast as it is now, how foolish it will look to people 50 years from now that we're even considering building an oil tunnel underneath the Great Lakes. There, are, there is no other Great Lakes in the world. Um, they can't be replaced. And we just know that now is the time for Governor Whitmer to follow through on her campaign promises to shut down Line 5 and revoke the easement. Um, you know, we never know when the next major incident with this pipeline is going to happen. Thank you. And Beth? Yeah, and I'll just echo everything that you all have said. And thank you so much, Liz, for hosting this conversation. 
as someone who has been looking at this pipeline network and this company for 10 years now, I see so many similarities to what led up to the 2010 spill and their actions since in what is playing out today with line five. And I just really urge everybody to reach out to Governor Whitmer and ask her to join uh, the, the AG's case as well as revoke the easement. And then I will do a shameless plug for the- Oh, I'm gonna do that. Oh, I'm gonna plug okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no problem at all, but I, I will. Um, well, now it's my turn. I, I just wanna thank all of the panelists. I cannot thank you enough. You all are just absolutely terrific. Um, you have incredible contributions, your deep knowledge, lasting commitments. Um, to the Great Lakes and, and our future prosperity here. Um, we're going to be following up with everybody um, on the call with the links to the recording and additional materials. Um, and I, um, I, I want to leave you with um, a final thought about um, the need for shutting down um, Line 5 and stopping this tunnel project is going to require all of us to continue to educate and empower ourselves, learning the facts, standing up for our public trust rights, being, working in solidarity with the tribes and, and taking action, um, uh, taking the actions that all of our panelists have indicated tonight. Um, the recent developments really expose this exponential risk that Line 5 pose, poses to the Great Lakes. And this is a historic moment. It's, it's decision time where we need immense public pressure for the fate of our Great Lakes, 20% of the world's fresh uh, surface water. And so to that end, you know, we ask you to take action following the links to urge Governor Whitmer to revoke the easement, join Attorney General uh, Nestle's um, uh, case before it's too late. And I would urge you to um, attend the Pipeline Safety Trust uh, 10th anniversary uh, um, webinars that you see here on, on, on the screen. Um, and then if we can uh, go to the next slide, please. We also have podcasts from the Michigan uh, Climate Action Network and Groundwork, um, again with Beth uh, and Larry Bell. And there is, there's so much to learn, um, but together we are going to shut down this pipeline. Um, and it, it takes a movement and it takes the, the absolute passion, dedication and persistence um, of all of us. So once again, I just wanna thank you for attending and taking action to protect the Great Lakes.